title is? The title of the message is, What Did Jesus Mean? And I'm going to do this message in like a Bible study format. So everybody has to speak up loud so Coupine can get it and put it up on the uh, internet. And I might use some part of this uh, sermon for the uh, Bible study at uh, Heather Hill, too. All right. But we're going to start out tonight uh, in some known verses that people will often take out of context. We start in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile with him, twain. Give to him that asked thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thee away. You have heard that it had been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, these passages of Scripture are often used uh, by people that are trying to convince the Christians that God intended for us to uh, be used as formats. Mm -hmm. that, uh, if, that we, as Christians... We actually will show true Christian love by allowing people to abuse us and misuse us. But that's, that's as far as you can get from the truth. Now, I want you to turn over here to Matthew 10. And in Matthew chapter 10, we read verses 34 through... Well, I actually want to start with verse 32 through 42. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before the fa my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before him, men, him will I also deny him before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I come to send peace on the earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life, for my sake, shall find it. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet, in the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man, in the name of a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink, Unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, I would say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Now you seem to have two contradictory statements here. On one side over there it says, well, uh, you know, turn the other cheek and uh, walk an extra mile. And uh, return, it says, to love your enemies, and even those that treat you. But over here now, he says that he came not to bring peace, but he came to bring a sword. So it seems to be like a, a contradictory statement. But it's the farthest thing from a contradictory statement. Let's take a look at that. Well, he says here, uh, Think not I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What has to come before peace? When the Lord Jesus comes back, there will be peace. But what comes before the peace? War. The War. sword is going to yeah. come before the peace. Now, when he returns at Mount Olives with all of his saints, 
thousands by thousands times thousands, uh, is he coming back to make nice nice? When we fight the armies of the world? No. When you fight the armies of the world, what, okay, is your objective? To win. Right. The objective when you go to war is to kill more of the enemy than they kill you. That's right. Right? Now, so he's making a point there. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at a couple things. Let's go back real quickly to Matthew 5. And in Matthew 5, when you study Scripture, there are five W's that is a good thing to remember. The five W's. Who, what, when, where, what why. Can. Number one, who is he talking to? You see, if you go ahead and try to just apply everything that says in Scripture to yourself, well, you're going to have a real mess there, right? So, uh, you know, John the Baptist said, Herod, you've taken your brother's wife. Well, there's another passage. Jesus said, go and do the same. Right? So, if you just take everything out of context, when you take a verse out of context, it becomes a pretext, right? Any text out of context becomes a pretext. No. So the first thing, we've got to say, well, who is he talking to? I think I know right where the answer is. We go to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up unto a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, well... See, so he's talking to his disciples here. Number two, uh, what is he talking about? So we know who he's talking to, but what's he talking about? Well, I, I think I know the answer to that too. You see, he starts off by, by talking about the civil tunes. Then Jesus goes, starts with ver in verse 13, and then verse 17, he starts talking about the fact that he fulfilled the law. And starting in verse 20, he starts talking about the definitions of murder. And in the verse 27, he goes into a teaching on adultery. And then in, in, in verse 31, he starts talking about divorce. In verse 33, he starts talking about taking oaths. And then in verse 38, he's talking about vengeance. 43, uh, he's talking about love. And then he, he's talking about giving of alms in chapter 6. And then uh, fasting in verse 16. Prayer over there in, in verse 6. Uh, he's talking about laying up your treasures in verse 19. So these are what he's talking about. So now you know who he's talking to, and you know what he's talking about. But why? Why is he talking about it? Well, that answer there you'll find too. If you go to, to Matthew 7 and read verses 24 through 27. In Matthew 7. We read... There you go. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Now let me ask you a question. When he was referring to Peter over Matthew 16, and he says, well, uh, said Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, for thou art Petros. And upon this <coughs> Petra, I build my church. So if you look at that in the Greek, Petros is a stone. 
And Peter said, Peter said he was a living stone, and we are too. We're living stones. But the rock was, Petra, was the Lord Jesus. Now he's telling you again here, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. <coughs> and the rain descended. And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell. It was a great fall. And it came to pass when Jesus said unto these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Well, now, so we take a look at why now he was telling them. The purpose of all of this was to instruct them to listen to what he was teaching and preaching and try to live what he was instructing, right? So now, when? When is this being done? Well, if you go on back on over to Matthew chapter 10, here, uh, We see a couple of things. One is that, and well, let me go back to back to five, actually. You're having the time that this is taking place is what you call it's a transition period. <coughs> And it's a transition from what is called the mosaic economy to the Christian economy. Now, what that mosaic economy was, was the fifth dispensation period. In other words, he's transitioning from the period of the law over to the period of grace. So, he's <coughs> talking to the apostles during this time. Now, during that time, Israel was under the rule of who? Rome. The Roman Empire. Now, why do you think he said if someone tells you to carry, uh, to carry their robe, uh, their cloak for a mile, carry it too. The law was in those days that a Roman soldier could stop uh, anybody, any man, and petition him to carry. He was obligated to carry that Roman soldier's weaponry, whatever, for one mile. For one mile. So Jesus is telling them what? Don't resist them. Don't resist the evil. This was the evil. Why was that? Were they under Roman rule for obeying God, or were they under Roman rule for disobeying God? Disobedience. Okay, now, at this period of time, we're going to see something here. That it was still, they still had time to receive Messiah and have the Millennial Kingdom entered in. But they... As we go through this, we'll see this. So what happened? So this transitional period between the Mosaic economy and the Christian economy was a period going from the 5th to the 6th dispensation. So he was speaking at, to the nation of Israel, but especially, particularly to the disciples. He was speaking to the disciples. We just saw that. Verses 1 and 2 in chapter 5. And we saw exactly what he was saying. We, we, we showed you all the different th things that Jesus was speaking of. And then we took you, we just went and saw why the instruction was to build and to live their life based upon what he was teaching them. And when we see it is this time now, this transition period, between the um, mosaic to the Christian economy, and now where? So we've looked at all of these things, and if you go right back to where we were in Matthew 5, 
But you go back to Matthew chapter 4, and you start reading verses 23 through 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching in the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Assyria, and they brought unto him the sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatics. We call them today what? Liberals. Liberals. Liberals, yeah. yeah. And those that had the palsy and healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from uh, Judea and far from beyond the Jordan. Now, <coughs> so we, we took a look at this and we, we saw this very clearly. Uh, who, what, why, where, and when. And now that scripture starts making a lot more sense to you. Because how is that used, that text there, that today it's often used uh, by those that will tell you that Christians should allow themselves to be abused by the world because that's what Jesus taught. But that's the farthest thing that he taught. He was speaking to the apostles at a time during the transition when they were going from one under Roman rule and what was about to happen? Jesus could have still ushered in the Millennial Kingdom. Had he ushered in the Millennial Kingdom, what would have happened to the Roman rule? The Roman rule would have been gone by the wayside. Okay. No Gentile salvation? There wouldn't have been. And there would have been no Gentile salvation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, here, if you go to Matthew chapter 7, and we take another look at a couple of these, what appear to be contradictory statements. In Matthew chapter 7, we read, uh, verse 1, Judge not, that ye be not judged. For what, what judgment you, you judge, <coughs> you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, here, it appears that he's telling them not to judge. But is that what he's telling them? <coughs> no, he's telling them that with whatever standards that you hold someone up to, you will be judged by the same standard. Well, how do you know that? Well, let's go to verse 20. Whereby their fruits you shall know them. Well, how... Do you know them by their fruits unless you're doing what? You're judging their fruits. In other words, their fruits are what? Their works, right? Mm -hmm. So he's telling them. Now, uh, he's telling them that, again, not that we're not to judge. If someone turns in their Bible and they can read very loudly from 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 2, starting with verse 11. And if you read that, well, now actually just go right down <coughs> to the last two verses in chapter 2 of, oh, this is one of these days. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it late for now. Just go down to chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, read the last two verses in this chapter. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now do it again. Read the same thing again. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For, uh, for who hath judged the? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So, we're not only are we to judge, but we're to judge everything. Yeah. We're to judge everything. Now, when people, you have these preachers today, why would so many of these preachers totally take that passage in Matthew 5 out of uh, context? Well, could it be that 
there are those that don't have the stomach for a fight. That don't have a stomach for a fight. We're to stand fast, hold our ground. So in other words, if they don't have a stomach for a fight, uh, to allow themselves to be abused, well, they're really not into that. They're into convincing you, you shouldn't allow yourself to be abused. And what happens when uh, you have these people that don't have the courage to stand up and stand fast, and then someone with courage comes along, someone with a stomach for the battle comes along. Jesus said, who will fight on the Lord's side? How does it make the person who doesn't have the stomach for the battle look? Foolish. It's cowardly. 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 Now how many of you people, when you go to war or in anything, want to follow a coward? Not too many. Okay. So, so what happens? Uh, they don't want. They don't want you to be bold, and that's why these they these pacifists totally take scripture out of context because they don't have the the stomach for the battle for the fight. Now, now, now what what's the dividing line for somebody that's just being bold and somebody's just being contentious? Well. Someone who's being bold is standing up for principle without compromise. Somebody who's just being contentious, uh, they're just looking for controversy. Now, we know, we know some people that well, can actually do both. And you know who I'm talking about. Uh, a fellow has got a real tendency to want to be very contentious. And, uh, but he's, he's a good man. He's got a good heart. And that's Pastor Kent. Uh, but he, he likes he likes the controversy. He's always trying to get uh, some kind of controversy going or some kind of an argument going, uh, just in his nature. Okay, but but he uh, he won't pull back down. So here now, if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter six, in Matthew chapter six. Verses 19 through 21, we see something a little different here. We read, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and dust is corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and someone read verses 11 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and read verses 11 through 17. For other foundation can, can no man lay, uh, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of, this, of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built, upon, uh, built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Uh, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. All right, so first of all, it answers number three, W. Uh, on what was he talking about? There, it's phrased differently by Paul, but he's saying, telling you the very same thing. Then he's telling you too that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you to allow that temple to be abused and nope. desecrated? No. Nope. No. Okay. So he's making that point very clear. Now, when you when you go back to Matthew 10, 
And in Matthew 10, I want to read you verses 5 through 14. <coughs> These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaria enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely have ye received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves for the workmen and the worthy of his meat. And in whosoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who is in it is worthy. There abide till you go thence. And when you come into the house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not, be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear the words, when you shall depart out of the house or city, shake the dust off your feet. Now, what is, what is still at this time he sent them out to who? Lost sheep of the house of Israel. To the house of Israel. He told them not to take anything with them. Why? Because there was still time for Israel to receive Messiah. Okay? And so now, again it goes back to, when are you talking about? Going back now to Matthew chapter 5. Here, and, well, let me see. Now, let me go back to 10, but Matthew 10. Here. Going back to Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to take a look at verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Now, when he says this, this is called in the scripture the divine paradox. The divine paradox. Now, this principle was taught more than any other principle by the Lord. Right here. He, he is taught over and over. And what is that simply, what's he simply saying? Let me read that again. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Now, this morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, I had a fellow come into my office. And, uh, I mean, he is just... Uh, as he has now three weeks in a row when I'm trying to work on my message. And he's got all kinds of problems, just overwhelmed by problems. And he lets these problems worry him, and he's so consumed. Now, I was telling him, I said, here's your problem. Your problem is this, that all of these things right now that are consuming you very shortly won't matter at all to you. The time is coming, the time is coming, and this will happen. There is no chance it will not happen. This will happen. That only what is written here, right here, with all of the sources of information we have in the world today, we've got the internet, we've got spy agencies, we've got satellites, we've yeah. got radio, we've got the printed press. But there's only one that can be absolutely reliable. One that will not change. Only one. There's only one that can't be changed. And that's the Word of God. Amen. God said He would not allow it. Heaven and earth to pass. And He has done exactly that. Amen. So, that time will come when only this is all. Now right now, this doesn't matter. You're, all, you're totally obsessed with living your own life. You've got all these problems. You know what, what you want to do. Here's what He says. Let me do it again. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. This 
world is not about you. This world is not about you. You see, it's not. You see, look, look what will happen. If you died, and you died, and you died, this world would just go on. Go on without you. You see? Because this world and everything in it is held and sustained by A, the media, B, government programs, or C, God. <coughs> C for Christ, right? Amen. See, that's, that's what it's going to come down to. It's not about us. We're sustained by Him. I told this fellow, I said, look, right now you're, you're worrying about these things here that seem to be keeping you up at night. Things could change in a hurry. Let me explain something to you. When bullets start flying in this country, if we get into a civil war, I'll bet when bullets are flying, you won't be a bit concerned mm -hmm. about the zoning inspector. I'll bet that zoning inspector coming over here and checking will not, won't even, won't even enter your mind when bullets is whizzing by you, right. you see. And I'll bet that when the bullets start flying, and we're heading that way now in this country, unless God intervenes, we're heading towards the Civil War. Amen. And I'll bet the zoning inspector won't even, won't even be concerned with coming down here and hassling you <laughs> when he's ducking bullets, right? See, you got to think on these things instead of being just totally obsessed with me, my, and I. This world is not about us. That's right. When we're gone, it'll go on without us, right? Now, what's the other thing? Well, turn over. There's this fellow, some of you, I know if you heard of him. His name was Solomon. He had a reputation for having some smarts, right? Amen. But compared to this other fella, Solomon was really a dummy, in a sense. And we'll talk. We'll take a look at who this other fellow was in a minute. But now, if you go over to Ecclesiastes chapter three, and you read this, to every Thing, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. For everything there's a season and everything time. See, we're we're getting into something here. It's called common sense too. Now liberals cannot comprehend this. That's right. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up, a time that which is planted. Now, when I'm telling you this, and I'm not, I'm not just saying this. The reality of what is the, the world system today is in total opposition to what the Word of God teaches. Now, liberalism is, in, this is why when I often I've been telling you, and just recently I've had more people say, I finally understand what you're saying now when you say that they will always do the opposite of what they say. They're, they're finally watching and they're learning on everything, right? Now let me give you an example. A time to be born and a time, well no, everything, uh, there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. It would never occur to me, listen, it would never occur to me to go out and cut my grass if there's six inches of snow on the ground. I, would, I wouldn't even think about cutting my grass if I had But now listen, that's not the case with a liberal. A liberal might, might try that because, because of the fact that it is insanity. And I'm not saying this to be mean to liberals, but liberalism is a form of illness out there, what we call that today. Scripture calls it what? Simple-mindedness. Matthew, or Isaiah 32, 1 through 8, what does it say? It says the vile person's a liberal eye. Right. Okay, now he goes on, a time to be born and a time to die. Well, a time to be born is when a woman has conceived a child, and that time 
to be born is when nine months after conception. Right. A time to die, the Lord has set us three score and seven, right? Or three score and ten, rather. Today, that's not the case, right? A liberal says what? Kill innocent babies? Yeah. Kill innocent babies. Now, a time to kill and a time to heal. Mm -hmm. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, if you want to know what that means, if you let Tom and Jim get up and dance, the rest of us would mourn. <laughs> you try. <laughs> Jim told me he could do the elevator dance. Did you know that? Oh. No steps. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> the time to cast away stones and the time to gather stones. The time to embrace and the time to refrain from embracing. Time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to, you know what, I remember this fellow one time who I ran into and he's missing his teeth in the front. <coughs> I said, what happened? He said, a fellow said to shut up and I thought he said stand up. So in other words, when he was told to shut up, he stood up and got and lost his teeth. You see, because the fellow meant what he was saying. Now he said, "A time to love and a time to hate." Now when is there a time to hate? What are we to hate? Hate what God hates. Hate what God hates. We're to love the things that God loves. Hate the things that God hates. That's. Fairly simply understood it. You know. Time of war and a time of peace. When there, when is there peace? When the Lord comes back. When the war is over, right? And the right. war will be over then, won't it? Amen. Now, what profit hath he that worketh, that wherein he laboreth? Let me ask you something. Let's just say that you went out there and you worked every day, you went up and uh, you preached Jesus, but you weren't saved. Okay, now apart from, no, let's, let's do it this way. Let's just say that you went out and you did good deeds for everybody. You helped old ladies across the street. You went and did all these good deeds all day long, but you weren't saved. How much would that have placed up for you as far as crowns in heaven? None. Okay, now, let's just say, big time, that you go to the bank. And every week you go to the bank, and there's this lady there at the bank, and you give her your money. Okay. The problem is, the lady don't work at the bank. She just shows up to meet you. So every week, you give her your money, but you don't have an account at the bank, you see. It's called the wife. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> We've done that. So, so how much of that goes towards your account? None. None, right? <laughs> and see, what happens apart from Christ, if you're not saved, all your works go for naught. That's right. They're just not. You hear people say, well, now, nah, I've lived a pretty good life. Oh, yeah. I don't think I'm a bad person. I'm as good as the next guy. Right. How much... How much time will that get you in heaven? Yeah. I hear that all the time when I'm evangelizing. All the time. You know, when you tell them that won't get you 10 seconds in heaven, they look at you like, mm -hmm. well, that's not what I've always believed. Okay. Right? Exactly. So, he goes on to say, I've seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. 
<laughs> See, Elgore thinks he knows that. And why is it that we don't know that what we know about creation is that God did the creation, but we don't know how he did it? The reason is there's only one one eye wouldn't one witness that was there when it happened, that was God, huh? Amen. Okay? So what do these guys do? Do they want to theorize? And they come up with these 20 billion or 50 billion. I mean, they're just pulling numbers out of thin air. All right? It's somebody's imagination. And so, here he's making a point. Save your breath. You don't know! Just save your breath. You don't know how God did these things. Right? Yeah. It's far beyond your comprehension. You're just not equipped to understand that. Now let me ask y'all a question. What would be, would you say, would be the greatest of God's accomplishments? Would you say that the creation of the universe, with everything that's in it, or would you say the eternal forever salvation of one lost sinner. And that, that one right there. Save salvation. That one last lost sinner that lasts for eternity. Not even the universe lasts for Amen. eternity, does it? Amen. Okay. So now here, I know that whatsoever God doth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Why is it, why is it that men are always trying to improve on what God... See, here's, God gives us church government. Here it is. Jesus Christ alone is the head of the church. Right. The local pastor is the under-shepherd. The, what? The elders and the deacons and the people. I can, you know what? I can grasp that. That's not difficult, you know. I can tell you all that, you see. But now, that's too simple for the world. So they have to complicate it. And they make this bureaucracy. And they come up with things like Vatican's and things like assemblies and uh, things like senates mm -hmm. uh, and things like conventions. They try to insert something between... Christ and the pastor of the local church. Is that meant to elevate God or is that meant to elevate man? man. Didn't that God say that's a no-no? Mm -hmm. Now, has it been your experience you're better off when you A, obey God, or B, disobey God? Obey, man. I'd say, you know, that uh, you've got a much better, ch or, or much less chance of being a dumbhead, right? If you obey God, wouldn't you think? No. Here. He says, Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it, the man that men should fear before him. In other words, don't fool with it. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requires that which is past. Now, what in the world does all of that mean? That which is... Is there anything new under the sun? No. Okay, it says that which has been is now, which has been in the past. Let me ask you this. Is Tom older than dirt or not? <laughs> he actually is. Right. So... What is now has been in the past. We existed in the past. Didn't exactly. We? Okay. We existed in the mind of God, didn't we? Anything that exists in the mind of God, is that as real as things that you can feel and touch? Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Now, he says this. That which has been is now, and that which has, which is to be has already been. So, here now, Every little child that's ever going to be born that hasn't been born yet, God already knows them, doesn't he? They already right now exist in the mind of God, don't they? 
And then he says, and God requireth that which is past. So, what in the world does that mean? Let me ask you this. Is there anything you've done in the past that you did it so long ago that by now God's forgotten it? If you can remember, chances are God, God's got it. He's got it documented, huh? Yeah. So, all right. I think with that, I think I'm just going to say, any questions? Martha had an interesting question. She wondered, now, if it's in the mind of God, those are spirits that already exist before they, go, before they have a body? Yep. Now, she wanted to know, do, do they know each other? Do, do they know each other? Uh, <coughs> no, they know God. I said, I, 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 said, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of anything that would... They're not in each that. other's minds, they're in the mind of God. They yeah.